Jeremiah 29, 11 says this. God's talking, he says, for I know the thoughts. Isn't that crazy? God's thinking thoughts about you. God's up in heaven, he's thinking about you. He's thinking about you. Crazy. He says, for I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. God's thinking thoughts about you, not bad thoughts, but good thoughts. Man, your feet must be tired because you've been running through God's mind all day. For real. God's been thinking about you and he's thinking good thoughts. He's thinking thoughts to prosper you, not thoughts to hit you with his holy fly swatter. But why do we get these pictures in our mind that God's out there looking to, to punish us, to hurt? I believe Jesus took all our punishment on the cross. So we're gonna be talking about this tonight, but let's pray and we're gonna jump right into it. So Father, right now, we just thank you so much uh, just for bringing us all here. God, we know last year with everything, with COVID, quarantine, all that, that we couldn't gather together. So this tonight is something special that we never wanna take this sort of thing for granted, that we can gather together with fellow believers and worship you and dive into your word. So we ask you tonight that you challenge us that you show us new things in your word. Show us exactly, exactly what we need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you know when you have faith that God's gonna show you exactly what you need to hear? Do you know that, that for you, I might say something up here, but God could speak to your heart. Like I've had times where people come up to me and they're like, hey, that's crazy what you said that one thing. That's exactly what I needed. And I'm like, did I say that? Why? Because I might have said something in passing, but the Holy Spirit brought it up in my heart and that was exactly what you needed. Because I believe when when someone's called by God to to preach the gospel, even if it's maybe you guys at work, at school, you're talking to someone, God can rise up a word in your heart that that person needs to hear. So when you come in faith to church and you come expecting that God's gonna speak to you, what's he gonna do? He's gonna speak to you. I know you're looking at me, I'm looking at you, but let's be looking to him. Let's keep our eyes and our expectancy and our faith on him because there's only so much I can do. There's only so much you can do. But man, there's nothing he can't do. There's nothing God can't do in your life. I like when God appears to Mary and he says this. He says, hey, you're gonna give birth. Um, She's like, hey, how's that possible? I haven't, and God's like, God's like, hey, the Holy Spirit's gonna come on you. You're gonna be pregnant. You're gonna give birth to the Messiah because all things are possible with God. All things are possible with God. So again, I'm looking at you, you're looking at me, but let's look towards him because all things are possible with him. And I believe the truth can set us free. So one word of truth from God's word, man, it can challenge you, change you, rearrange you, can turn your life upside down. And it can change everything. One word from God can change everything. So get in faith, be expecting. Again, let's look to him, not each other, but to him. So we're talking about what to do when you don't know what to do. What do you do when you don't know what to do? And I was thinking it's kind of like this. Anyone like to go hiking? Anyone here like to go hiking? I need need a volunteer. Um, Let's see. Uh, Philip, is that you back there? Come on up here. Come on up here, Philip. Everyone give it up for my man, Philip. Philip is one of our amazing greeters on the team. He's here every week making everyone just feel warm and fuzzy when they walk through these doors. And he's single? Yes, oh no. So ladies, take note. I mean, you can give me that $5 tomorrow. Is that okay? Yeah, okay, I got you covered. Um, Phil, put this backpack on. So we're gonna pretend like Philip, he's going hiking. Again, how many of y'all like to go hiking? So he's going, he's going on a little hike through the woods. So let's pretend he starts on the trail. He's doing his thing. Come on, let's go walk. Well, Philip gets lost. And he thinks he knows his way back. Maybe he tries to backtrack, but it gets dark. So all of a sudden, Philip is stuck in the woods. It's pitch black. That's a scary place to be, right? I remember about a month ago, we took our leaders out to a, uh, we had like a hayride and we had like a corn, corn maze type thing. And I'll admit, I got lost in the corn maze. I was with uh, Brian, Sharon. Uh, I don't know if Aaron's here. We kind of had split off from the rest of the group because we thought we knew the way out. And we didn't. And it started getting dark and uh, man, it was just, it was crazy. We were in there for like an hour. I thought I was gonna like have to live in there for the rest of my life. But, but man, Philip's going hiking, it's getting dark and he gets lost, okay? 
So maybe he wakes up the next morning in the middle of the wilderness. He's still lost. So he's just trying to make it through the day. He's just trying to survive, man versus wild style, survivor man. So he finally, after three, four days, he makes his way out of the wilderness. And I think that's a perfect picture of a lot of us, and maybe not us, but the rest of the world. They're going through life and they're lost. And they're just trying to make it through the day. They don't know where they're going. That they're just, man, they're struggling day after day. They have no hope. And man, the the world is tough. Life is tough. They're lost and they're just trying to make it through. But us as believers, we shouldn't be walking like that. Why? Because we have the God who created the whole universe living on the inside of us. And God actually created uh, a plan for your life before you ever lived a single day. If you never heard that, um, I want you to know God has a plan for your life. But if you don't know it, you'll never walk in it. If you don't know what that plan is, you can never walk in it. But the first step to knowing what that plan is, is you gotta know there is a plan. So again, Philip, he's been stuck in the woods for three, four days. How you feeling? You're tired. Hungry. Oh man. Well, Philip had this backpack here the whole time. Hold on a second. Let's see what's in here. Turn around, turn around. So, you know, he's got this backpack on. Maybe he doesn't know what it's in it. Maybe he didn't check. So, so let's see. Where, uh, Where are we at here? So what do we got in here? Oh, okay. Got a walkie-talkie. Got this ancient thing that no one knows what it is. I think they used to use these like in Egypt or something. Um, it's a map. <laughs> it's like a dinosaur. Uh, what else we got in here? Cell phone. Water. Jerky, that looks good. Philip had everything he needed in here. Man, he had everything he needed but he didn't know it. Did you know that was in there? I didn't tell you. So man, guys, give it up for Philip. But I believe a lot of us, I believe a lot of us are going through life. Man, a lot of us are going through life. And we have this amazing plan that God prepared before we ever lived a single day. I'm getting thirsty. My bus is open right now. That was a gross noise. (laughs) But God has this amazing plan for your life. He has this incredible, this plan that, man, he, he etched out before you ever lived a single day, that God has all these great things you're called to do. The Bible says there's good works God planned for you to do ahead of time. But if you don't know what he's called you to do and you don't even know there is a good plan, you'll just be like my man Philip, going through the wilderness, getting lost, having everything he needs. He could have called someone on that phone. He could have called someone on the radio. If he even couldn't do that, maybe didn't get reception. He had food, water. He just didn't know. He had a map to get up. A lot of times we just don't know God has good plans for us. And if we don't know, we can't walk in them. What you don't know can hurt you. People say, oh, what you don't know can't hurt you. No, it can. Because we're all called to do something very specific. And there was a, um, a teaching that went around years ago. Um, not lately, but there was a very popular, popular Bible teacher who taught this message that God's will is whatever. And guys, that is totally biblically inaccurate. Why? Because I'm gonna read you this verse over in Psalms. And I'm gonna let you decide for yourself. It says here, Psalms chapter 139, starting at verse seven. It says, I can never escape from your spirit. Talking about God. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell in the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me. Isn't that incredible that no matter where you go, God wants to guide you, he wants to lead you, that you might think you're too far from God, but he's not too far from you, that he wants to lead you and guide you. You haven't walked too far. God is still there right by your side. Can I hear an amen? Amen. So it goes on to say, your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. Come on, that's good. Verse 11 says, I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in the darkness, I cannot hide from you. To uh, To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. And what does that mean? It says, hey, I could cover myself in darkness, but God, you're gonna be there. That sounds like something creepy off like a weird horror movie. But what does he mean? He says, hey, I could go out and man, I could live this life of sin. I could live my own way. I could, man, I could live just to please me. I can go out and just live crazy. 
I could do the craziest thing. And you know what? God's love is still going to be there that your life could look the darkest, but God still wants to shine through with his brightness in the darkest situation. And it says, even the night to you is bright because God loves to show up and there's dark situations. So you might be like, hey, my life is dark. I'm living for me. I'm, I'm, man, I'm just going out. I'm partying. I'm just doing all this stuff. I'm not living for Jesus. I want you to know, even in the midst of that, God wants to show up and shine bright in your life. That your mistakes don't intimidate God. That God's not looking at you saying, hey, um, I see what you're doing. I saw what you did last Friday. I saw what you did last summer. And I just want you to know, I still love you. God has not given up. Even in the darkest night, come on, God still loves you. And he's still got an amazing plan for your life. It goes on to say this. It says in verse 13, you made all my delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. I was wondering why some of you guys are so complicated. Um, It goes on to say, your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. Isn't that awesome? Anyone like stare in the mirror? Like, you know, you're in the morning, you're getting ready. You're just like spending your time with Jesus and you're just praising him for all he's done in your life. And you're like, hmm, God, I'm so good looking. Thank you for making me so good looking. God, you're so good for making me good looking. I think it's just funny. Um, none of us do that, but that's literally what David's saying. <laughs> he's saying, he's saying, hey, um, your workmanship, it's marvelous. How well I know it. It's just, it's funny to me. Um, he says, verse 15, you watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, talking about in his mother's womb. Um, goes on to say, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. Uh, verse 16 says, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life, I want you to listen to this, guys. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God? They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you're still with me. And I want you to know this, that God hasn't given up on you. God's up there thinking thoughts about you. And this verse actually says, it's more thoughts than grains of sand that are on the sea. And I did a study a while back just to see how many grains of sand there are in the earth. Like as if someone's actually counted it. And they estimate, again, I don't know how they know these things, but they estimate there's actually 10 quintillion. I didn't even know there was a number. 10 quintillion or over 10 quintillion grains of sand in this earth. And that tells me God has more than 10 quintillion thoughts about you. And again, you hear that and you're like, oh no, something's got to be bad. Like God's got at least like maybe 50% of those are not good thoughts. But God doesn't act like us humans. That you might think of someone, maybe your parents and you're like, half my thoughts about them are like, oh, I love my parents. The other half are like, ooh. Lord Jesus, help me. No, I I want you to know every single thought God thinks about you, it's a good thought. Why? Because he loves you so much. Come on. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the thoughts I I think towards you, thoughts to give you a hope and a future. But I love in this verse, it says this, and we're going to jump back up to uh, to verse 13. It says, you made all my my delicate inner parts of my body. God made every part of you and he knows every part and he still loves you. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You know God made you exactly how you're supposed to be? We live in a day and age with a lot of gender confusion and all that, but I want you to know, God loves you exactly as you are. If you struggle with those thoughts and you, you know you're trying to figure stuff out, I want you to know, man, this is where you belong, that you don't need to believe like we do to belong. But God made you perfect. The way God made you was perfect. And even just on a lesser note, some of you might be like, man, I just feel like, ah, uh, like I look in the mirror and my nose is too big and just like, you know, this is wrong and that's wrong. I believe stuff like that. Man, if God made you a certain way, you need to love yourself. You need to love the person God made. And there's things you can, like I'm not saying it's bad to work. I think all of us should take care of our bodies. But at the end of the day, there's certain things you can't change. And you just need to be like, God, I trust you that you made a masterpiece when you made me, that you made me exactly how I was supposed to be, and you don't make any mistakes. Do you believe God makes mistakes? Do you? And if you don't agree with me, again, you don't need to believe like we do to belong. We still love you. We still want you to be part of this place. But 
God doesn't make mistakes. I believe he made you exactly into the person you're supposed to be. Moving on. Okay, you guys didn't like that one. He says this. He says, you watch over me, in verse 15, being formed in utter seclusion, as woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. I love that verse 16, that God, God says this. He says, um, I saw you before you were born. Every day of your life was recorded in a book before you ever lived one. God has a book up in heaven. He wrote your autobiography. I guess it would be your biography if you didn't write it. He wrote your biography before you ever lived a single day. See, God's up in heaven. And again, that, that biography, it's not, it's not bad. It's not God's writing all this horrible stuff that's gonna happen to you. Like sometimes we think that book is called, what's the one series of unfortunate events? Like that's, that's the book he wrote about you. No, no, God wrote this good book, this amazing book. And we're gonna get to a couple verses that prove that in a second. But God wrote this book about your life. David's saying here, you wrote down every single one of my days before I lived one. And I'm, no, you might've had some bad days, but I believe those bad days weren't in God's book. That stuff might happen to you in this life, but God wants to cause you to triumph. He wants to bring you up and out of that. That you might have had struggles, you might have had temptations, but I believe if you open up God's book, maybe you can look at last Friday and it says, okay, um, it says, we've got Seth over here. Like Like maybe last Friday, Seth did not have a good day. Maybe he made some mistakes. Maybe he was out, he decided, hey, I'm gonna gonna smoke some wacky weed and like, let's have a good old time. (laughs) All right, so, so Seth's like, was that in God's book? Was that in there? But I believe if you open up God's book to that day, maybe God had something entirely different. Maybe, maybe God wanted him to go reach out to someone, to love on someone that needed help. Maybe, maybe God just had just a fun, fun, godly fun day planned for Seth, but instead Seth was out doing all this other stuff, okay? But what do you do? What do you do when you're, what you're living does not line up with God's book he wrote about you? I believe in those moments, you can just say, God, forgive me. And God's not looking down at Seth saying, how dare you do your own thing? I, I planned out this day. I planned out every day before you live one. And you're just living like you're, however you wanna live. You're just living like the devil himself, Seth. Does God say that? No, I believe God's looking down at you and he's saying, it's okay, I love you. Let's try tomorrow. Let's try tomorrow to do everything you're called to do. Um, it's okay, we all make mistakes. I still love you. I believe God's looking down with grace and mercy saying, hey, I haven't given up on you. It goes on to say that, hey, not only has he written out every single one of your days before you lived one, but it says, verse 17, how precious are your thoughts about me? They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand on the seashore. So God's thinking thoughts about you. And I want you guys to turn to Jeremiah 29, 11. So again, if you're like, okay, what kind of thoughts are those? Like, I know God's thinking thoughts, but eh, maybe they're not good. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, King James, uh, New King James Version says, uh, for I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. That's what God's thinking about you. So if Seth might have messed up, he might have fell short. God's looking at him. Is he thinking, man, I need to throw my judgment on him. I need to throw my wrath on him. No, because God already poured that out on Jesus. Jesus already took our place. So if we come to him, we ask for forgiveness. And we say, God, I messed up. I shouldn't have done that. All of a sudden, God wipes it away. He forgives us. And the Bible says that his goodness and his grace is new every morning. Every morning. I think sometimes we're going to God and saying, God, I'm sorry for messing up the the hundredth time on that. And God's saying, what are you talking about? For me, that's the first, because I already forget, I already forget about the other 99. Because the second you ask for forgiveness and you repent, God wipes it away like it never happened. He doesn't even remember it. Uh, New Living Translation says this. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. The NIV says this, uh, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you. God wants to prosper you. Again, that's not what it's all about. Sometimes people focus so much on the prosperity aspect, and I think that's where they miss it, that, hey, that's what the whole gospel's all about. It's not. The whole gospel is the fact that Jesus wants to use you to reach people far from him, and life is all about loving God and loving people. That's what this whole thing's about. But does God want to prosper you? Does God want to bless you? Does he? I mean, it says right here he does. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Let me ask you this. If you're not prosperous, 
can you help someone else? Like, let's say you don't have enough money to pay your bills. You don't have enough money to pay your school loans. You don't have enough money to pay attention. And all of a sudden, you see a homeless man on the side of the street. Can you help him? But what if you're so blessed that God's giving you enough money to pay all your bills and help that homeless man and tithe? Ooh, ooh, moving on. Just saying. Uh, Message translation says it like this. It says, God says, I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you and not abandon you. Plans to give you a, the future you hoped for. The future you hoped for. Again, God wants, God wants to bless you. He wants to give you this great, amazing life. Why? So you can keep it to yourself? No. So you can help bless others. I look at it like, like this. Some of us, some of us are just clogged pipes. You ever have a clogged pipe at home? You got to call the, uh, the plumber in. He does his thing. And clogged pipes are awful. Like I remember recently, my parents' basement flooded. And it was awful. There was water everywhere. Why? Because a pipe had gotten clogged. Well, some of us are like that spiritually. I believe that, yeah, God wants to bless you, but not so you can keep it to yourself. Some people are like, man, I'm believing God's going to bless me. Why? Oh, so I can be rich, so I can keep it all to myself. And we know we're not called to do that. We know we're called to be a giver that God wants to bless you so you can be a blessing. God doesn't care if you have stuff. He just cares if stuff has you. The Bible says in the New Testament, Paul says, God gives you all things richly to enjoy. If you like to do something, as long as it's not sin, we know that's not okay. But if there's something that you like to do, I believe that God wants to bless you with that thing. Why? Because he loves you so much. And again, if God blesses you maybe with a new car, I think we always need to have the position of saying, God, if you told me to give up that car, I'll give it up in a heartbeat. My first car I ever got, I got a revelation of this fact that God could bless me. I didn't tell anyone I was believing for a car, but I was just like, I was a young kid. I think I was 17 at the time. And I said, God, I believe you can get me a car. I wasn't working a job at the time. I was still in high school. I just got a revelation that, hey, God, you you can do this. The Bible says the cattle on a thousand hills is yours. So I just prayed, just trusted God, didn't tell anyone. Once you know it, someone called me up and said, hey, I just feel like God's put on my heart to bless you with a car. Crazy. Again, you're like, did you tell someone? No, I didn't tell anyone. I just trusted God. And I said, God, you can do this. And some people are like, no, 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 no. Like, God, how dare you ask God for a car? How dare you? God, there's so many people in need on the other side of the planet. There's so many people in need um, just everywhere you look. How dare you ask God? He's got more better things to do. Well, is God big enough to help both of us? And how is me being poor help someone else who's poor? If, some, if this guy over here, you know, is homeless, he's begging, he, he just, I mean, he doesn't have enough to get by. How is me being poor too help him? But man, if I believe God wants to bless me, he wants me to be prosperous. I can help this guy out because now I have more than enough. Again, I think some of us are like a, a pipe that's been clogged. Because us as Christians, God wants to have us, he wants to bless us. He wants us to be prosperous so the water can flow through us so we can help other people. The water is not supposed to stay in the pipe. When God blesses you, even financially, it's not supposed to stay in the pipe that you're supposed to give it. And yeah, you can keep some, you you can, I think every one of us should save. I believe every one of us, God does want to bless us with good things. But at the end of the day, God blesses you so you can be a blessing. Do you guys agree with that? That God blesses you so you can be a blessing. So the pipe, water's going through it, but the water doesn't stay in the pipe. Some of us as Christians, we just try to keep everything God gives us. But what if God blessed you with something so now you could be a blessing to someone else? And I'm not saying we live these lives where we have nothing and we give up everything we own because how many know when the water goes through that pipe, that pipe gets wet. Some of that water does stay in that pipe. And I believe every time you look in the Old Testament, when you get people who come in covenant with God, David, Abraham, Noah, everyone you see, God blesses them financially. Why? So they can be a blessing to other people. So it goes on to say that God wants to, he he has plans to prosper you and not to harm you. So I believe that God has this plan for your life, this good plan, this amazing plan. And it's not all about that stuff, but God wants to put you, I believe God wants to put you that exact perfect place that he always planned for you. And I didn't plan on saying any of that. that. None of that was in my notes. So I believe God just put that on my heart and someone needed to hear it. 
But I believe it's not wrong to be prosperous. It's just wrong if you keep it to yourself. Greed, man, that's an evil thing. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil, right? A lot of people misquote that verse and say money is the root of all evil. No, the love of money. If God tells you to give up that thing you've been believing God for, would you do it? If God tells you to give up half your paycheck next week, would you do it? We need to be surrendered. Moving on. Okay, you guys didn't like that one either. A question that people always think when it comes to God's plan for your life is have I messed up too bad? And again, I just said all that stuff about God blessing you financially. It's not about that. I want to be very clear. You could have all the money in the world, but you don't have heart peace. Man, nothing means, means anything. You could have any amount of money and it doesn't matter. All the time you see these celebrities and they have everything in the world, anything you could ever hope for. And then you hear about, you know, this one tragically commits suicide. And then this one, man, they're hooked on, on this drug because they just feel so empty on the inside. And you hear all these tragedies that happen with these people that have everything. At least when you're poor, you can say, hey, someday it's gonna get good. But then when you have everything, you realize that's not what life's about. And you realize that stuff doesn't fulfill. And you're like, oh man, this is all kind of meaningless. So life is not about any of that. I want to be very clear that there is something God's called you to do and you will only be fulfilled when you do that thing that you might try to do other things, but on the inside, you're going to feel like something's missing. You're going to feel like there's a hole in your heart and you might be thinking, I just keep doing this and I feel like I'm empty. I feel like I'm doing this and I feel like I'm empty, but I believe you need to surrender and say, God, what have you called me to do? God, what's the thing that you created me for? I know we talked about finances a second ago. Some of us are led by money. I believe that we're not called to be led by money. I'm gonna take this job because it pays more. God might call you to take a job that doesn't get paid more. I remember feeling called to the ministry and I remember telling uh, some friends of mine and they were like, are you sure? There's not really much money in that. And I'm like, man, I'm I'm not living my life to make money. I'm believing God's my provider. I'm gonna do the thing I'm called to do My job is not my source. My God is my source. And I'm gonna, God, if God calls me to be uh, flipping burgers at McDonald's the rest of my life, I'm gonna do that. And I believe God can still bless me on top of that. But I'm not here to do the thing that's gonna make the most money. I wanna do the thing that God's called me to do, that God created me to do, that God wrote in that book before I ever lived a single day. But again, like I said a second ago, some of us think our past has disqualified us. Our past is disqualified. And if I think if there's anyone who could say their past would disqualify them, it would be the apostle Paul. That guy was messed up. And I love this verse. If you're at college weekend, I'm gonna recap a little bit. Um, We went over this. We talked about the apostle Paul over in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. Paul says this. He says, but by the grace of God, I am who I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Paul says there, hey, I am who I am by the grace of God working in me. What was Paul before Jesus? Before he came in contact with Jesus, who was he? Well, the Bible says he was Saul. His name was Saul. And he hated Christians. In fact, you can read in Acts chapter seven when, the, uh, when Stephen, who was one of the seven that was chosen, he's murdered by these religious people. Paul is there, his name was Saul then, but he's there holding the coats of the people doing it. He's helping the people that are killing Stephen, that are murdering him. Well, in that moment, the Bible says, Paul or Saul, he gets enraged and he just says, man, we're gonna get rid of these believers. We're gonna blot them out of this earth. So he goes from house to house, city to city. And the Bible says he drags out the believers and he takes them to court. He has some murdered, some killed, some thrown in prison. And he says, hey, uh, out of all the sinners, I was the worst. I mean, that's pretty bad, but I mean, I feel like people have done worse, right? But when you study out that portion of scripture in the Greek language, the picture it paints is that Paul did these things and he enjoyed doing them. I mean, he got pleasure of throwing Christians in, in, in prison. Man, he took joy in seeing that Christian over there murdered. He probably saw Stephen killed and he's smiling. That's a messed up guy. And God saved him. 
I don't know how many of you have killed a couple Christians lately. Like, let me know if you did. We might have to call the police. Um, But um, I want you to know God will still forgive you. But I want you to know this, that Paul, he was a mess. But Jesus appeared to him. God saved him. He's on the road to Damascus. He sees this bright light. Jesus appears to him and says, Paul, why are you persecuting me? I want you guys to know, Paul was not persecuting Jesus. He was persecuting Jesus' followers. What does that mean? That when you mess with God's people, he takes it personally. When you're gossiping about that fellow believer, you're gossiping about him, because why? He takes it personally. God takes it personally when you mess with his kids. Doesn't mean he's mad at you. Doesn't mean he's gonna strike you down. But man, God loves us so much. and He doesn't want you treating that believer in a wrong way. He takes it personally. So Jesus says, Paul, Paul, why do you persecute me? And basically he calls Paul, calls Paul, that rhymed. He calls Paul to go be a preacher to the nations. And then Paul starts going from city to city, preaching the gospel. This guy who was a murderer, God turns him into a missionary. And not just a missionary, because in his life, he impacted thousands of people, probably tens of thousands, because he went from city to city. Do you know Paul? Paul wasn't just a missionary to tens of thousands. But his scripture, he wrote two thirds in the New Testament. The scripture he wrote has impacted millions and millions and probably billions of people. God took this this horrible guy who's taken pleasure in murdering people and God turned this murderer into a miracle maker and God used him to change the world and he's still changing the world. God's still using his writings to impact us. So I don't care how bad you are, God can intervene and God can show up in a mighty way and God can take the Saul you are and turn you into a Paul. He can do it because there's nothing our God can't do. You might, you're not too bad. You're not too ugly. I want you to know God wants to use you exactly as you are. And we talked about this, that Paul writes that to the Corinthians. He says, hey, I am who I am because of the grace of God. And I believe he's saying that because he's telling them you can be who God's called you to be because of the grace of God. Because you can study out who the Corinthians were. Were in Corinth, the Bible says, um, Man, it was this city where Paul went, he preached the gospel to, but a little bit of history there was in uh, 146 BC, there was an uprising and Rome came and obliterated the city, completely wiped them out, wiped them off the map. But a hundred years later, Julius Caesar realizes where Corinth is located, it's actually prime real estate. It's in between a bunch of ports, people uh, come by with trading and he's like, man, we got to get something going. We got to rebuild the city. So he tries to get everyone to move back. But the problem is the city is in ruins. Nobody wants to move back. So he eventually goes to the people that are the lowest of lows. He goes to criminals. He goes to ex-soldiers, ex-slaves, legionnaires. He goes to all these people that are no good, that are uneducated, people that have nothing going for them. And he says, hey, I got a deal for you. You move to the city we're rebuilding, I'm gonna give you land. And I'm gonna make you a founding member of this city. That's a good deal when you got nothing going for you, that you get free land. Like, I mean, come on, we get excited in this country, we get free cell phones. But man, they're like, hey, free land. And you'll be a founding member. These people who are nobodies, all of a sudden, they're somebodies. So so what happens is, is these people move there and they rebuild this city and they're a bunch of nobodies. They're dysfunctional. They weren't educated. And man, the Bible says that there was a lot of perversion in the city. Uh, the Bible says there was a lot, of, a lot of drunkenness. In fact, in the ancient days, if you were a drunk, like let's say your neighbor was a drunk, people would say, oh, he must be a Corinthian. He must be a Corinthian. Why? Because it was a stereotype of the day that if you were drunk, you were a Corinthian. In fact, if you went to the theater back in that day and you saw a play and there was a drunk person in it, they would always, always, always be a Corinthian. Why? Because that was just the stereotype. That's who they were. And, and God saw this people that were looked down upon, that were nobodies, that were called out of this place that was nothing. And all of a sudden, they're placed in this town and they become someone. And then Paul shows up and he says, hey, I know you, you really were nobody, but you think you're somebody now, but God's gonna use you now to change this world. And Paul, Paul ends up showing up to them and he says the famous passage of scripture where he says, God calls the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And the reason he said that was these people were literally nobodies, uneducated, ex-soldiers, ex-thieves, people everyone looked down upon. And Paul's saying, no, 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 don't look, let anyone look down upon you. 
Don't let anyone look at you and say you're not good enough because God's gonna use those the world looks at and considers morons, the people the world looks at and says, you're not good enough, you're stupid, you're never gonna achieve anything. Those of us that maybe your teacher said, hey, you're a failure, I, I want you to drop out of this class because there's no way you can ace it. I, I want you to know those of us that people might look at and say, hey, you're gonna be just like your mom. You're gonna end up in prison just like your uncle. I want you to know those people, those of us that feel like we're failures, God wants to use you to change this world because at the end of the day, who gets the glory? You? No, because you know you couldn't do in and of yourself that you needed him. So has your past disqualified you? No. Has Paul's past disqualified him? No. Your past doesn't disqualify you. But what if you feel like you're not good enough? What if you feel like you don't have what it takes? And I want to read you this scripture. We're going to close here in a minute. I'm asking the band to come back up. But your past doesn't disqualify you. In 1 Corinthians 1, 26, and I just quoted this to you a second ago, but I think it'd be really good for us to just see it with our own eyes and just read it. But it says, 1 Corinthians uh, one twenty six. it says, for you see your calling, brethren, that not many of you are wise according to the flesh. Not many of you are mighty, not many noble that are called. But God has called the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Those of us that feel stupid, that feel like we're not smart enough, we're not good enough, God calls us to change the world. He goes on to say, uh, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Uh, God has chosen the weak things of this world to shame the strong. You ever look at someone and they're, you think they're better than you? They have a greater er than you? What I mean by that is maybe they're stronger than you, they're smarter than you, they're better looking than you. They always got something that's gonna be better than you. You ever feel like there's so many more people more qualified than you? Yeah, I'll stick both hands up. But God loves to call those people to change this world. It goes on to say, uh, God calls um, the base things of this world in verse 28. And the things that are despised, God has chosen. And I want you to know this, that word base actually is the Greek word a genus, which is where we get the word genes from. Uh, not like these, not like your wranglers, but like your genes that you were born in. When they discovered uh, the human gene, they named it after this Greek word, which describes the household you were born into. And you might think you were born on the wrong side of the tracks. You, think, you might think your parents are whacked out, but I want you to know the household you grew up in does not dictate your future, that you might have grown up on the wrong side of the tracks, but God loves to use those people to change the world. And it goes on to say the despised things. What does that mean? That God loves to use those that are despised. And the Greek word actually means um, someone that is so nauseating to the viewer that you're walking by, and you're so nauseated by this person you're walking by, you don't even look at them. It's messed up. But literally, that's the picture it paints in the Greek. And it paints the same picture that when Jesus was on the cross, and the Bible says he was despised and rejected of men, that people would see him on the cross, man, they would walk the other way. It paints the picture in the Good Samaritan when he's laying on the road, and all of a sudden, people, person after person, walks by, and they just walk the other way. Why? Because he was so nauseating to even look at. And that's such a horrible thing. We should never be that way as believers, that we should love everyone. But if you ever felt like you were despised, that no one ever wanted to give you the time of day, God wants to use you to change this world. And those of us that feel rejected, God wants to put you in places of influence where you can make a change, where you can help people. And God can use you to do things you never imagined. Why? Because at the end of the day, he gets the glory. God's called you to do something amazing with your life. This is just a feel-good message today, Devin. I don't know if I believe any of that. Well, that's what the Bible says. Paul, man, Paul, yeah, he faced, he faced tribulations. He faced trials. I'm not saying everything's gonna be easy, but God's gonna get you through it, and it's gonna be worth it. I'm sure if you could ask the Apostle Paul, hey, was it worth it? Yeah, you faced trials. You faced shipwrecks. You faced uh, persecution. But man, Paul, he ended up writing two-thirds of the New Testament. Was that worth it? that we're still being impacted by what he said. So man, I believe God's gonna use you to impact so many lives and God's gonna put you in a place of influence that you could never imagine. And I think that those of us that feel like we're not good enough, God loves to do something incredible in us and through us. I love the story about, uh, what's his name? Colonel Sanders he started KFC. Anyone like KFC? Do you know he started Kentucky Fried Chicken and he failed? His restaurant went out of business. His wife left him because of it. He went bankrupt. But everyone seemed to, to love his chicken recipe. So what did he do? At the age of 65, he decided to take his, uh, his restaurant on the road. So he takes it on the road and he gets so popular. In fact, he starts opening up restaurant after restaurant after restaurant. Everyone's talking about this Kentucky fried chicken. 
He ends up selling the company for I forget how many millions and millions of dollars. Someone who went bankrupt to the age of 65. It's never too late. You know, Walt Disney, Disney, uh, Walt Disney Productions was actually the second company he started. He started another production company that failed. Do you know he had several movies that bombed? One of them was Pinocchio. It's kind of crazy, right? If you feel like you failed and you're a failure, I want you to know your failure is not futile. That you do have a future. Does that mean I just get right back up? That's not what I'm saying. I say you get back up with him. And if you keep trying to live life in and of yourself, you're gonna keep failing. You're gonna keep falling. You might achieve some, some, some good things, but at the end of the day, if it's not what you were called to do, is it worth it? See, your destiny is tied with people. There's people you're called to influence. There's people you're called to reach. There's people that only you can reach. If I was to go into your school, they'd probably kick me out. They're like, who's this old dude just walking around Mountain Union's campus? I get nervous enough on Thursday nights when we got our U on campus there that someone's gonna kick me out. But I want you to know God's placed you where you're at for a reason. Your destiny is tied with people, people you're called to reach. And that's what this whole thing's about. That the job you work, you're not there just to get a paycheck. You're there to reach the people you're with. I believe every day you should be looking on mission. God, who do you want me to talk to? Who do you want me to pray for? Who do you want me to? I believe that should be us every day. I'm not saying you do it disrespectfully in a way you're gonna get fired for. But what if, man, it's, it's break time and you're talking to that, that fellow employee and you just start talking about the you. Hey, do you wanna come out sometime? I'll buy you Steak and Shake after. No one can say no to Steak and Shake, right? Man, what if you just look for those little opportunities every day and you prayed and said, God, use me. Lastly, I believe not only does God have this amazing plan for your life, I believe not only do, does your past not disqualify you, but your own shortcomings don't disqualify you. Let me say this. I feel like that sounds like it's a pretty good deal, right? That, hey, God loves me. He wants to use me exactly as I am. Mm-hmm. But here's what can disqualify you. You refusing to answer the call because we need to be surrendered. This takes surrender. If you're out there and you say, I'm just gonna keep doing my own thing, God's gonna bless you as much as he can. He's gonna love you. He's not gonna give up on you. Again, even in the darkest night, he's always there. He loves you so much. But you're never gonna achieve the greatness he's called you to. You're never gonna step into the amazing things he's planned for you. He's wrote a whole book of things he wants you to achieve and do. I wouldn't be where I'm at if it wasn't for God. I remember God calling me to the place I'm in. And I thought, God, there's so many more people more qualified than me. So many more people. But God got me here. Why? Because I was surrendered. And the Bible says this. I'm gonna close with this scripture. Over in the book of Isaiah, verse verse 19, chapter one, he says this. If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. What is obedience? Whatever God tells you to do, do it. The disciples are at a wedding feast. You guys know the story. Jesus turns the water into wine. What does Mary tell uh, tell the workers? This guy, Jesus over here, whatever he tells you to do, do it. I believe that's the key to miracles in your life. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. The key to it for you achieving your destiny is whatever he tells you to do, do it. And next week, we're gonna get into how do we discover that Tonight, I just want to make it kind of basic that God has this amazing plan for your life. But I want to close with this thought. It says, we need to be willing and obedient. So obedient is doing it, but willing. I believe willing is your heart posture. It's you in this moment saying, God, I don't even know what that thing is. But God, I want to do it. I want to do what pleases you. God, I want to do your will for my life. I want to be surrendered to you. I want to be willing because the, the truth is, You don't have to know what you're called to do, but to be willing to do it. You can say, God, I know your plan for me is good. I trust you with everything. So I surrender. I surrender everything to you. God, I don't know what the next step is, but I surrender to you. God, I might not know what this thing is I'm supposed to do when I get out of college, but God, I surrender to you. I might not know what I'm doing tomorrow, 
But God, I surrender to you. When you come to God with a heart of surrender, there's no limit to what he can do through you and in you and for you and to those around you. I believe we need to have this heart posture of surrender. Well, hey, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. And if you don't know this Jesus we talked about, this God that loves you, that has a plan for your life, I want you to know you can tonight. Tonight can be a fresh start. But I want you to know this. A lot of people have this messed up opinion of God that he's up in heaven just waiting to put the hammer down on you just because you did something wrong. But I want you to know this, that God's not looking at you like that, that God loves you so much and he's just waiting for you to turn to him. And the Bible says over in the book of Romans, it says that if you believe in your heart that Jesus rose from the dead and you confess him as Lord with your mouth, you'll be saved. You can have heaven when you die and you can have heaven on earth while you live. It's pretty incredible. But man, I want you to know God loves you so, so much and he's just waiting for you to take that first step towards him. So if that's you tonight, I want you to know it's as simple as just praying a prayer. That could be you taking that first step towards God. And it's all about believing in your heart and making Jesus the Lord of your life. So if that's you, I'm gonna ask you to pray this prayer with me. You're not talking to me, you're talking to God. But say this, say, Father God, I thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for me. Jesus, I believe that you went to a cross, that you went to a grave, and then you rose from the dead. And I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and as my Savior. And from this day forward, help me to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, congratulations, that's the most important decision you're ever gonna make. In fact, the Bible says it like this, that when one person turns to God, all of heaven rejoices. So I believe they are throwing a party tonight. But man, we're so excited for you and we'd love to connect with you. So do us a favor and text uh, the word, the you, that's one word, to the number 94,000. And we'd love to connect with you and help you on your journey of faith. And if you're tuning in tonight for the first time, thank you so much for giving a part of your day just to hang out with us. And we'd love to get a hold of you too. So text that number again, 94,000, and text the word, the you again. That's one word, the you. And we wanna get a $5 Starbucks gift card in your hand just for hanging out with us. So man, text that number. I promise we're not gonna put you in any weird group chats. We just wanna get a hold of you. And number one, let you know, hey, your family, and number two, we wanna get you that gift card just to say thank you for hanging out tonight. But man, we love you guys. You guys have been incredible. And just a reminder, we're live here every Wednesday night, 9.30. We'd love for you to join us. And every Thursday night at seven o'clock, we're gonna be putting these teachings online so you can check them out from home. But we love you guys. You guys have been incredible tonight and we'll see you next week.